We are glad to know that you're still there. We're going to take this small time that we have left to talk about um, uh, safety in electronic payment system and how we can use uh, homegrown solutions to uh, do this. We are privileged to have in our midst uh, Mr. Darlington Onyagoro, uh, who is uh, the CEO Aladdin Digital. Good morning and welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. Good morning, viewers. Yeah, a lot of people want to do business, uh, but they are afraid of electronic transactions. <laughs> so, uh, should they or should they not be afraid of this? Yeah, I, I, can, I can answer that both ways. I mean, uh, they shouldn't be afraid of electronic transactions because that's the future and that's actually the present. Uh, going by what happened in February when there was a cash crunch and with the narrative design, everybody realized that the best way to go is to actually begin to patronize different electronic channels like POS terminals, uh, mobile wallets, and so. Uh, it comes with its own challenges, but uh, everything that has uh, the good side also has the negative side. So they have to throw the baby and the bathwater out, you understand that? So there are ways to mitigate some of these risks, which we are going to discuss subsequently. Okay, but when, when, you, when we got to that time of uh, cash crunch, we found out that uh, the transactions were not even going. What were the challenges? What are the challenges in Nigeria that made us to suffer the way we did? So first of all, we have to also appreciate the fact that Nigeria, when it comes to payment, is actually more advanced than some countries in Europe and even in North America. Mm -hmm. I'll give you an example. We started enjoying instant payments almost like over 10 years right now. In some of those North American countries, when you do payments, it takes about two to three days to get to the beneficiary. I have accounts in the US. When I send those money back to my GTA, GTB account from my US account, it takes 48 hours to 72 hours to get to GTB. But today you can send money to somebody and in the next two, three minutes, the person gets the alert. So the problem was that the system was overwhelmed, all right? But because of the narrow policy and every other thing, more people migrated online and our system, the infrastructure was not ready to accommodate uh, that influx of new people, new people that actually began to migrate to that system. Unlike what the CBN told us, mm -hmm. I think they underestimated the volume of people that actually needed to do transactions per day, which as, at March was around 49.7 trillion that was transacted in terms of cashless transactions in Nigeria just in the month of March. In the first quarter, it was around 127 trillion that was transacted. So that inflows between January and March, the whole infrastructure and the wallet system, the banking system was not ready for it. So that led to massive failures. But the system is adjusting right now. And the levels of failures have slightly reducing also in the systems. What about um, homegrown uh, tech companies like you? You run Aladdin. Yes. Uh, so what about, what is your, the role that you're playing now to make sure it stabilizes? So most of the fintechs you have today, they are actually pioneering what we call wallet-to-wallet -wallet transactions. So why most of these failures occur is because you are doing interbank transactions. You are moving from you know, one commercial bank to the next bank or one system to the next system. And that goes through a switch. And when you go through a switch, a switch is, is the technology, so there's a possibility of failure. So, but for example, if you have say, some fintechs now have close to about 30 million users, and those 30 million users can do wallet-to-wallet -wallet transactions at zero cost. So because it's an intra-transaction within an ecosystem, the rate of failure is actually minimal. So all those homegrown solutions in terms of wallet transactions, in terms of even some of the contactless solutions they are bringing now, is actually aimed in improving adoption and also reducing uh, the instances of failure that we we'll see also. When you talk about wallet to wallet, I'm, yes. I'm only thinking bank because I don't, I don't know yes. how else to move money and to keep money. So what do you do? Do you connect that to your bank account or something? How do you do it? So the beauty of wallet to wallet transactions is that you can actually fund your wallet in so many ways. First of all, you can fund your wallet by, by what they call attaching your card. Or in, in, in fintech balance, we call it tokenizing your card. So whether it's a MasterCard, or a Visa card, a Strawberry card, American Express, or your VEF card, you can actually attach it to your wallet. And with the click of your button, you can always fund your wallet from your debit card, all right? Or you can do, some wallets have what they call virtual accounts that are attached to them. All right, so that you, can, you can also fund your wallet through virtual accounts. But the beauty is that once that money enters into the ecosystem, all right, and you have other wallet users in that ecosystem, it becomes quite easy for you to make payments in a time with, minimum, with at zero cost. Because the average cost for interbank transfer is between 10 naira and 15 naira, right? You know, based on CBN regulation and based on the amount you are transferring. 150. Uh, so it all depends. <laughs> so, if, for example, if you are doing POS transaction and you are going to do cash withdrawals, I mean, sometimes they charge you as much as 800 naira or 1,000 naira, depending on. But, see, but, but the fintechs are actually building an ecosystem, not just within Nigeria, but they are building an ecosystem within Africa. And that's what people 
people like us, like Aladdin, is trying to achieve. Because you find out that payments within Africa is actually broken. It's as, as expensive as 15%. Some corridors between Tanzania and Uganda to send payments is at, as high as 36%. So what we're trying to build is to build a Pan-African wallet system where I can easily send money to you in Kenya, in Rwanda, or in Ghana, in almost at zero cost and in two minutes because you are doing wallet to wallet transaction. So that's where fintechs are actually innovating in that space. So while there are other uh, pro, uh, solutions that are trying to do interbank connections, you know, trying to connect CBNs across different jurisdictions, which is also prone to failure, but the wallet to wallet transaction also reduces that, you know, incidences of failure. And that's the kind of ecosystem that most fintechs are trying to build right now. Can the banks take advantage of what uh, the fintechs are doing? Yeah, but this is about the, man, the fintechs cannot actually operate without the banks, because most of the banks are the, the license one. Most of the most of the fintechs are relying on the licenses of the bank because they have to collaborate. And the other truth is that some of these switches that make some of these things happen are also controlled by the CBN and the banks are stakeholders in those switches. But just that the difference is that these guys are actually innovating on top of what the commercial banks are doing. Commercial banks are big; they have legacy systems, so they will not be able to iterate and innovate fast as fast as fintechs who are soft, so who, who, who are simple and nimble and able to take quick decisions than a commercial bank. I worked in GTB. I worked in some of those banks. By the time you write a memo and you get approval down to the MD, MD level, it might have taken one week, two weeks, three weeks. But if Fintech is run by 30 people, 20 people with their CEO and their co-founders, they can take a decision within 24 hours and it's the, the dev guys already building it. So that ability to be nimble and to be innovative and to iterate and to build faster, that's what differentiates the fintech ecosystem from the commercial bank ecosystem. How safe is this? Yeah, that, it's, it's actually safe because you see the protocols that actually moves this money around is actually being encrypted. So like I told you, they're also relying on existing infrastructure. You cannot build something on nothing. And the, 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 the good thing that we have is, apart from the Kenyan market, where you have M-Pesa, which is mobile money, all right, the Nigerian interbanking system has been very, very helpful in facilitating fast payments in Nigeria in the past more than 10 years, even our POS terminals and everything. Before, you used to have POS terminals, we have much chance get T plus one. That means they get, they get settlement the next day listening to liquidity crisis. But now, you can actually get settlements, you know, same day or even same minute when you use your POS for collections. Mm -hmm. so, in, so all these, things are, these innovations are being built on an existing infrastructure, which is also being improved uh, daily. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So um, is there a deliberate policy you would want from government to make these things even more in our society? Yeah, you see, uh, some of the, you know, the, the some of, like for example, we have the sandbox system from CBN. We have some uh, policies that came out recently, all right. But the truth about the matter is that, uh, in terms of making it easy for, for example, there are so many licenses available. And I tell you, we have uh, different licenses for different types of fintechs. There are about eight categories or fourteen categories of fintechs. But sometimes it's not usually very clear which license you need to do a business as a fintech. Do I need to get good for this license? Why do you get a microfinance bank license and stuff like that? So that level of clarity is why most fintechs are still relying on the license of a partner bank to do transactions. I believe some level of clarity will actually, actually help. And at the same time, too, you know, let's, let's not, the, the elephant in the room is the truth is that it's the issue of crypto. You understand that? So most of the transactions are actually moving in that, in that space, what they call stable coins, you know. After now, people are not too sure about CBN stand on crypto. You know, for example, we had about last year they want to start you know, taxing you know, revenues from crypto. So we're not too sure. So people, guess what? Nigeria is among the top three in terms of usage of crypto in the whole world. It's among the top three in terms of the number of people that use crypto. It's over 13 million people use crypto in Nigeria, bigger than any other African country. So it's an elephant in the room. So we need to understand what is the regulation, clear regulation in terms of stable coins and not because and those can actually make interbank payments and Pan-African payments also easier. When I can use stable coins to make payments, you know, in shopping malls and stuff like that. Some of this clarity, you know, in terms of regulation is what we also seek in that space. Okay. When you talk about wallet to wallet, we're wrapping up now. When we talk about wallet to wallet, for instance, Aladdin has an app. Of course. Does the person I'm transferring to have to have Aladdin app? That's what I'm saying. So the, 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 you don't need to have an Aladdin app. Aladdin can do wallet to bank. You get my point? Every filter can do wallet to bank or wallet to mobile money. So I can do wallet to GTB or wallet to, sorry for calling, any, any of the banks. <laughs> but you see, well, but, but when, you have, when, you, when, when you, both of you have the same Aladdin app, you don't need to pay that 10 Naira or that 20 Naira or that 15 Naira, send money to your commercial bank account. I can send money to your own Aladdin wallet. And it's faster. The failure rate is less than 0.01%. I get to my point because you are sending money within the Aladdin ecosystem. You are not taking it outside the bank. Because when you are going outside the bank, you need a switch. 
No, no, but so if, if, if someone happen. has the Aladdin app, yes. I'm using it because you are the CEO exactly. of Aladdin. Exactly. You have Aladdin app, and yes. someone else that I intend to send money to mm. has another kind of app. Exactly. I will be charged, right? You, you'll be charged if we decide to charge. But most of the filters are offering free transfers. You know, and that, that's, that, that's the marketing gimmick of entering the market. If you look at most so of the filters. So how do you make the money? There, there are many ways of making the money. See, that's why I need to talk about what they call fintech economics. So for fintech, sometimes it's not about making money. They sacrifice making money for valuations. So if, that's why like Uber. Uber was not profitable for a long time, but Uber was valued over $50 billion. So when you come to the startup world, what they're looking for, is, what your investors are looking for is your level of transaction volume. How many users do you have? What's your churn rate? What's the level of engagement? How many active users do you have? What's your GMV? The, the, your gross mass, you know, what, the volume of transactions you are doing. Because by the time you can get people hooked up into your ecosystem, you can start beginning to introduce charge. I don't want to mention a very popular fintech today in Nigeria that has over 40 million users. When they started, it was free. But gradually, they introduced 10 Naira after like every 10 transactions. So they have 30 million people. By the time they charge 10 Naira times 30 million people, you can see that in a single day, the, the millions they're going to make. But they started by sacrificing that initial revenue to gain traction. And that's why most fintechs play in that direction. Exactly. How much time do we have to, <laughs> to, to take these, these free, freebies from you? No, but, but I'm sure that that window is also closing because their investors are becoming more vociferous about revenue. All right? So, over 2021, over $2 billion came into Africa in terms of fintech investment. You know, billions of dollars are coming into Nigeria, Kenya, some of the major hubs, fintech hubs in Nigeria. So, and investors are also becoming wary of just doing free transactions without showing signs of profit and, you know, and revenue. So, people are rethinking that model into building profitable and revenue, you know, sustainable businesses, business models also in fintechs. What's the future of uh, fintech? in Nigeria? The future of fintech is actually awesome. Uh, but uh, even, like the, even the banks realize it. That's why the banks are not doing hackathons. They are doing events to incorporate the fintech model into their own model. That's why they are partnering with fintechs. All right, because the, the fintech, the, the, the ability to iterate faster, you know, makes it easier. And that's why I say most of the banks are now going for the group model, you know, what they call the hold co. So that hold co allows them to have a fintech arm. I can mention Sterling Bank has one, GT Bank has a hold code. Everybody's going you to have GT. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was a former staff of GT, so <laughs> I was an SGT. So I can tell you for free that everybody's going towards that hold code. Under GT Bank, you have Squad, you know, which is also a fintech arm of GT Bank. But well, that's the future. And the reason, if you look at the reason why they did that, the valuation of a fintech can go as high as 33x. But, but the valuation of a commercial bank can, can, cannot exceed more than three or four X in terms of, you know, the value. But if fintech can start today, and we look at, for example, Paystack was sold for $200 million within four to five years. Mm. How many banks can you sell for $200 million in four to five years? Mm. Now, look at uh, Flutterweave is valued at $3 billion. On the other point, so the, the valuation level of fintech is usually higher if you get it, if you execute well. Mm. So that's the future. And everybody knows that they need to have an arm of fintech in their whole code because of the level of value you can get from fintech in a short while. Okay, well, uh, he talked to me like an orator, and then sometimes used the jargon that only the fintech <laughs> people will understand. <laughs> but the beauty of it is that there is a future, and we are tapping into it as Nigerians, and it is a very good thing. I'd like to thank you, CEO of uh, Aladdin Digital for coming on the show. Thank you very um, much. And uh, we do hope that uh, whatever policy needs to be put in place will be put in place so that people like you and others who are struggling to come up as well will do the needful. We've been talking with uh, Mr. Darlington Anyaguru, uh, CEO of Aladdin Digital on uh, the program this morning. We do hope that you had a wonderful time. This is where we'll draw the curtain on the program this morning. It's um, going to be uh, another very wonderful day tomorrow so do join us then my name is nyamgul agaji thanking you on behalf of the entire team bye for now